Chapter One of the Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter One the white-headed eagle soaring above the spray of a tennessean forest looks down upon the clearing of the squatter to the eye of the bird it is alone visible and though but a spot in the midst of that immense green sea it is conspicuous by the color of the trees that stand over it they stand but grow not the girdling ring around their stems has deprived them of their sap. The ivory bill of the log cock has stripped them of their bark. Their leaves and twigs have long since disappeared, and only the trunks and greater branches remain, like blanched skeletons with arms upstretched to heaven, as if mutely appealing for vengeance against their destroyer the squatter's clearing still thus encumbered is a mere vistal opening in the woods from which only the underwood has been removed the more slender saplings have been cut down or rooted up the tangle of parasitical plants have been torn from the trees the cane brake has been fired and the brush collected in heaps has melted away upon the blazing pile only a few stumps of inferior thickness give evidence that some little labor has been performed by the axe even thus the clearing is a mere patch scarcely two acres in extent and the rude rail fence that zigzags around it attests that the owner is satisfied with the dimensions of his agricultural domain there are no recent marks of the axe not even the girdling of a tree nothing to show that another rood is required the squatter is essentially a hunter and hates the sight of an extensive clearing as he would the labor of making one the virgin forest is his domain and he is not the man to rob it of its primeval charms the sound of a lumberer's axe, cheerful to the lonely traveler, has no music for his ear. It is to him a note of evil augury, a knell of dread import. It is not often that he hears it. He dwells beyond the circle of its echoes. His nearest neighbor, a squatter like himself, lives at least a mile off and the most proximate settlement is six times that distance from the spot he has chosen for his cabin the smoke of his chimney mingles with that of no other its tall column ascends to heaven solitary as the squatter himself the clearing is of an irregular semicircular shape a deep narrow stream forming the cord and afterwards cleaving its way through the otherwise unbroken forest in the convexity of the ark at that point most remote from the water stands the cabin a log shanty with clapboard roof on one side flanked by a rude horse shed on the other by a corn crib of split rails such a picture is almost peculiar to the backwoods of america some may deem it commonplace for my part i cannot regard it in this light i have never looked upon this primitive homestead of the pioneer without receiving from it an impression of romantic pleasure something seems to impart to it an air of vague and mystic grandeur perhaps i associate the picture with the frame in which it is set the magnificent forest that surrounds it every isle of which is redolent of romance 
such a scene is suggestive of hunter lore and legend of perils by flood and field always pleasant to be remembered of desperate deeds of heroism performed by gallant backwoodsmen or their equally gallant antagonists those red warriors who once strode proudly along the forest path but whose upright forms are no longer seen under the shadow of its trees perhaps it is from reflections of this kind that i view with interest the clearing and cabin of the squatter or it may be from having at one period of my life encountered incidents in connection with such a scene of a character never to be forgotten in spring this picture is transformed suddenly as by the shifting of a panoramic view or as upon the stage the harlequin and brilliant columbine emerge from the sober disguisement of their dominoes if in winter the scene might be termed rude or commonplace it now no longer merits such titles nature has girded on her robe of green and by the touch of her magical wand has toned down its rough features to an almost delicate softness the young maize planted in a soil that has lain fallow perhaps for a thousand years is rapidly combing upward and the rich sheen of the long lance-like leaves as they bend gracefully over hides from view the sombre hues of the earth the forest trees appear with their foliage freshly expanded some as the tulip tree the dogwood and the white magnolia already in the act of inflorescence the woods no longer maintain that monotonous silence which they have preserved throughout the winter the red cardinal chatters among the cane the blue jay screams in the pawpaw thicket perhaps disturbed by the gliding of some slippery snake while the mockbird regardless of such danger from the top of the tall tulip tree pours forth his matchless melody in sweet ever varying strain the tiny bark of the squirrel and the soft cooing of the carolinian dove may be heard among other sounds the latter suggestive of earth's noblest passion as its utterer is the emblem of devotion itself at night other sounds are heard less agreeable to the ear the shrill chirrup of cicadas and tree toads ringing so incessantly that only when they cease do you become conscious of their existence the dull gluck gluck of the great bullfrog the sharp cries of the heron and quabberg and the sepulchral screech of the great horned owl still less agreeable might appear the fierce meowing of the red puma and the howl of the gaunt wolf but not so to the ears of the awakened hunter who through the chinks of his lone cabin listens to such sounds with a savage joy these fierce notes are now rare and exceptional even in the backwoods though unlike the war whoop of the indian they have not altogether departed occasionally their echo may be heard through the aisles of the forest but only in its deepest recesses only in those remote river bottoms where the squatter delights to dwell even there they are heard only at night and in the morning give place to softer and sweeter sounds fancy then a fine morning in may a sunshine that turns all it touches into gold an atmosphere laden with the perfume of wild flowers the hum of the honey-seeking bees the song of birds commingling in sweetest melody and you have the mise en scene of a squatter's cabin on the banks of the obion 
half an hour after the rising of the sun can such a picture be called commonplace rather say it is enchanting forms suddenly appear upon the scene forms living and lovely in the presence of which the bright sunshine the forest glories of green and gold the bird music among the trees the flowery aroma in the air are no longer needed to give grace to the clearing of the squatter it signifies not that it is a morning in the middle of may were it in the dreariest day of december the effect would be the same and this resembles enchantment itself the rude hut seems at once transformed into a palace the dead trunks become corinthian columns carved out of white marble their stiff branches appear to bend gracefully over like the leaves of the recurrent acanthus and the enclosure of carelessly tended maize plants assumes the aspect of some fair garden of the hiberides the explanation is easy magic is not needed to account for the transformation since there exists a far more powerful form of enchantment in the divine presence of female beauty and it is present there in its distinct varieties of dark and fair typified in the persons of two young girls who issue forth from the cabin of the squatter more than typified completely symbolized since in these two young girls there appears scarce one point of resemblance save the possession of a perfect loveliness the eye of the soaring eagle may not discover their charms as did the bird of jove those of the lovely leda but no human eye could gaze for a moment on either one without receiving the impression that it was looking upon the fairest object on earth this impression could only be modified by turning to gaze upon the other who are these young creatures sisters there is nothing in their appearance to suggest the gentle relationship one is tall dark and dark-haired of that golden-brown complexion usually styled brunette her nose is slightly aquiline and her eye of the oblique indian form other features present an indian character of that type observable in the nation of the chickasaws the former lords of this great forest she may have chickasaw blood in her veins but her complexion is too light for that of a pure indian her dress strengthens the impression that she is a sangmali the skirt is of the common homespun of the backwoods striped with a yellowish dye but the green bodice is of finer stuff with more pretensions to ornament and her neck and wrists are embraced by a variety of those glancing circlets so seductive in the eyes of an indian bell the buskin moccasin is purely indian and its lines of bead embroidery gracefully adapt themselves to the outlines of feet and ankles of perfect form the absence of a headdress is another point of indian resemblance the luxuriant black hair is pleated and coiled like a coronet around the head there are no combs or pins of gold but in their place a scarlet plumelet of feathers from the wings of the red cardinal this set coquettishly behind the pleats shows that some little attention has been given to her toilette and simple though it be the peculiar coiffure imparts to the countenance of the maiden that air usually styled commanding although there is nothing masculine in this young girl's beauty a single glance at her features impresses you with the idea of a character 
of no ordinary kind a nature more resolute than tender a heart endowed with courage equaling that of a man the idea is strengthened by observing that in her hand she carries a light rifle while a horn and bullet pouch suspended from her left shoulder hangs under the right arm she is not the only backwoods maiden who may be seen thus armed and accoutred many are even skilled in the use of the deadly weapon in striking contrast with all this is the appearance of her companion the impression of the eye receives in looking on the latter is that of something soft and beautiful of a glorious golden hue it is the reflection of bright amber-colored hair on a blonde skin tinted with vermilion imparting a sort of luminous radiance divinely feminine scrutinize this countenance more closely and you perceive that the features are in perfect harmony with each other and harmonize with the complexion you behold a face such as the athenian fancy has elaborated into an almost living reality of the goddess cytheria this creature of golden roseate hue is yet very young scarcely more than a child but in the blue sky above her burns a fiery sun and in twelve months she will be a woman her costume is still more simple than that of her companion a sleeved dress of the same striped homespun loosely worn and open at the breast her fine amber-colored hair the only covering for her head as it is the only shawl upon her shoulders over which it falls in ample luxuriance a string of pearls around her neck false pearls poor thing is the only effort that vanity seems to have made in the way of personal adornment even shoes and stockings are wanting but the most costly saussure could not add to the elegance of those pretty mignon feet who are they these fair flowers of the forest let the mystery end they are sisters though not the children of one mother they are the daughters of the hunter the owner of the cabin and the clearing his only children happy hunter poor you may be and your home lowly it can never be lonely in such companionship the proudest prince may envy you the possession of two such treasures beyond parallel beyond price end of chapter one chapter two of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter two marion and lillian passing outward from the door the two young girls pause in their steps an object has attracted their attention a large dog is seen running out from the shed a gaunt fierce-looking animal that answers to the very appropriate name of wolf he approaches the sisters and salutes them with an unwilling wag of his tail it seems as though he could not look pleased even while seeking a favor for this is evidently the purpose that has brought him forth from his lair he appeals more especially to the older of the girls marian oh wolf i see your sides are thin old fellow you want your breakfast what can we give him lil indeed sister i know not there is nothing for the poor dog there is some deer meat inside ah i fear father will not allow wolf to have that i heard him say he expected one to take dinner with him to-day you know who an arch smile accompanies this half interrogatory but for all that the words do not appear to produce a pleasant effect on the contrary a shade is observable on the brow of her to whom they are addressed yes i do know well he shall not dine with me tis just for that i've brought out my rifle 
Today I intend to make my dinner in the woods or go without, and that's more likely. Never fear, Wolf. You shall have your breakfast, whether I get my dinner or not. Now, for the life of me, Lil, I don't know what we can give the poor brute. Those buzzards are just within range. I could bring one of them down. But the filthy creatures, ugh, even a dog won't eat them. See, sister, yonder is a squirrel. Wolf will eat squirrels. I know, but no, it's a pity to kill the little creature. Not a bit. Yon little creature is a precious little thief. It's just been at our corn crib. By killing it, I do justice in a double sense. I punish the thief and reward the good dog. Here goes. The squirrel, scared from its depredation on the corn, sweeps nimbly over the ground towards the nearest tree. Wolf, having espied it, rushes after in headlong pursuit. But it is rare chance indeed when a dog captures one of these animals upon the ground. And Wolf, as usual, is unsuccessful. He has treed the squirrel, but what of that? The nimble creature, having swooped up to a high limb, seats itself there and looks down upon its impotent pursuer with a nonchalant defiance at intervals more emphatically expressing the sentiment by a saucy jerk of its tail. But this false security proves the squirrel's ruin. Deceived by it, the silly animal makes no effort to conceal its body behind the branch. But, sitting upright in a fork, presents a fair mark to the rifle. The girl raises the piece to her shoulder, takes aim, and fires. The shot tells, and the tiny victim, hurled from its high perch, after making several somersaults in the air, falls right into the jaws of that hungry savage at the bottom of the tree. Wolf makes his breakfast upon the squirrel. This young Diana of the backwoods appears in no way astonished at the feat she has performed. Nor yet Lillian. Doubtless it is an everyday deed. You must learn to shoot, Lil. Oh, sister, for what purpose? You know I have neither the taste for it nor the skill that you have. The skill you will acquire by practice. It's worth knowing how, I can assure you. Besides, it is an accomplishment one might stand in need of some day. Why, do you know, sister, in the times of the Indians, every girl understood how to handle a rifle? So father says. True, the fighting Indians are gone away from here. But what if you were to meet a great bear in the woods? Surely I would run away from him. And surely I shouldn't, Lil. I have never met a bear. But I'd just like to try one. Dear sister, you frighten me. Oh, do not think of such a thing. Indeed, Marion, I am never happy when you are away in the woods. I am always afraid of your meeting with some great wild beast which may devour you. Tell me, why do you go? I am sure I cannot see what pleasure you can have in wandering through the woods alone. Alone. Perhaps I am not always alone. These words are uttered in a low voice, not loud enough for Lillian to hear, though she observes the smile that accompanies them. You see, Sister Lil, continues Marion in a louder tone, our tastes differ. You are young and like better to read the story books your mother left you, and look at the pictures in them. My mother left me no story-books nor pictures. She had none and did not care for them, I fancy. She was half Indian, you know, and I suppose I am like her, for I too prefer realities to pictures. I love to roam about the woods, and as for the danger, pooh, pooh, I have no fear of that. I fear neither bear nor panther, nor any other quadruped. Ha! I have more fear of a two-legged creature I know of, and I should be in greater danger of meeting with that dreaded biped by staying at home. The speech appears to give rise to a train of reflections in which there is bitterness. The heroine of the rifle remains silent while in the act of reloading, and the tinge of melancholy that pervades her countenance tells that her thoughts are abstracted. While priming the piece, she is even maladroit enough to spill a quantity of the powder, though evidently not from any lack of practice or dexterity. Lillian has heard the concluding words of her sister's speech with some surprise, and also noticed the abstracted air. She is about to ask for an explanation when the dialogue is interrupted. Wolf rushes past with a fierce growl. Someone approaches the clearing. A horseman, a man of about thirty years of age, of spare form and somewhat sinister aspect, a face to be hated on sight, and at sight of it the shadow deepens on the brow of Marion. Her sister exhibits no particular emotion. The newcomer is no stranger. It is only Josh Stebbins, the schoolmaster of Swampville. He is their father's friend and comes often to visit them. Moreover, he is that day expected, as Lillian knows. Only in one way does she show any interest in his arrival, and that is on observing that he is better dressed than usual. The cut of his dress, too, is different. See, Sister Marion, cries she in a tone of raillery, how fine Mr. Josh is, black coat and waistcoat, a standing collar, too. 
why he is exactly like the methody minister of swampville perhaps he has turned one i shouldn't wonder for they say he is very learnt oh if that be we may hear him preach at the next camp meeting how i should like to hear him hold forth <laughs> the young creature laughs heartily at her own fantastic conceits and her clear silvery voice for a moment silences the birds as if they pause to listen to a music more melodious than their own the mock-bird echoes back the laugh but not so marian she has observed the novelty as well as her sister but it appears to impress her in a very different manner she does not even smile at the approach of the stranger but on the contrary the cloud upon her brow becomes a shade darker marian is some years older than her sister old enough to know that there is evil in the world for neither is the backwoods the home of the arcadian innocence she knows the schoolmaster sufficiently to dislike him and judging by his appearance one might give her credit for having formed a correct estimate of his character she suspects the object of his visit more than that she knows it she is herself its object with indifferent grace therefore she does receive him scarcely concealing her aversion as she bids him the customary welcome without being gifted with any very acute perception the newcomer might observe this dig up on the part of the young girl he takes no notice of it however either by word or the movement of a feature on the contrary he appears perfectly indifferent to the character of the reception given him not that his manner betrays anything like swagger for he is evidently not one of the swaggering sort rather is his behaviour characterised by a cool quiet effrontery a sort of sarcastic assurance ten times more irritating this is displayed in the laconic style of his salutation morning girls father at home in the fact of his dismounting without waiting to be invited in sharply scolding the dog out of his way as he leads his horse to the shed and finally in his throwing the saddle-bags over his arm and stepping inside the cabin door with the air of one who is not only master of the house but of the situation inside the door he is received by the squatter himself and in the exchange of salutations even a casual observer might note a remarkable difference in the manner of the two men the guest cool cynical confident the host agitated with eye unsteady and heart evidently ill at ease there is a strange significance in this salutation and also in the little incident that follows before a dozen words have passed between the two men the schoolmaster turns quietly upon his heel and closes the door behind him the squatter making no objection to the act either by word or gesture the incident may appear of trifling importance but not so to marian who stands near watching every movement and listening to every word why is the door closed and by josh stebbins that rude door that throughout the long summer day is accustomed to hang open on its rawhide hinges all day and often all night except during the cold wintry winds or when rainstorms blow from the west why is it now closed and thus unceremoniously no wonder that marian attaches a significance to the act neither has she failed to note the agitated mien of her father while receiving his visitor that father at all other times and in the presence of all other people so bold fierce and impassable she observes all this with a feeling of pain for such strange conduct there must be a cause and a serious one that is her reflection the young girl stands for some moments in the attitude she has assumed her sister has gone aside to pluck some flowers growing by the bank of the stream and marian is now alone her eye is bent upon the door and she appears to hesitate between two thoughts shall she approach and listen she knows a little she desires to know more she has not merely conjectured the object of the schoolmaster's visit she is certain it concerns herself it is not simply that which troubles her spirits left to herself she would make light of such a suitor and give him his conge with a brusque promptitude but her father why does he yield to the solicitations of this man this is the mystery she desires to unravel can it be a debt scarcely that in the lawless circle of backwood society the screw of the creditor has but little power over the victim of debt certainly not enough to enslave such a free fearless spirit as that of hickam holt the girl knows this and hence her painful suspicion that points to some other cause what cause she would know she makes one step towards the house as if bent upon espionage again she pauses and appears undecided the chinks between the logs are open all round the hut so too the interstices between the hewn planks of the door no one can approach near to the walls without being seen from the inside and a listener would be sure of being discovered 
is it this reflection that stays her in her steps that causes her to turn back or does the action spring from a nobler motive whichever it be it seems to bring about a change in her determination suddenly turning away she stands facing to the forest as if with the intention of launching herself into its sombre depths a call of adieu to her sister a signal to wolf to follow and she is gone whither and for what purpose why loves she these lone rambles under the wild wood shade she has declared that she delights in them but can we trust her declaration true hers is a strange spirit tinged no doubt with the moral tendencies of her mother's race in which the love of solitude is almost an idiosyncrasy but with her this forest ranging is almost a new practice only for a month or so has she been indulging in this romantic habit so incomprehensible to the home-loving lillian her father puts no check upon such inclinations on the contrary he encourages them as if proud of his daughter's penchant for the chase though purely a white man his nature has been indianized by the habits of his life and in his eyes the chase is the noblest accomplishment even for a woman does the fair marion think so or has she another motive for absenting herself so frequently from her home let us follow her into the forest there perhaps we may find an answer to the enigma end of chapter two chapter three of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter three the lovers rendezvous glance into the forest glade it is an opening in the woods a clearing not made by the labor of human hands but a work of nature herself a spot of earth where the great timber grows not but in its place shrubs and tender grass plants and perfumed flowers about a mile distant from the cabin of hickman holt just such an opening is found in superficial extent about equal to the squatter's corn patch it lies in the midst of a forest of tall trees among which are conspicuous the tulip tree the white magnolia cottonwoods and giant oaks those that immediately encircle it are of less stature graduating inward to its edge like the seats in an amphitheatre as if the forest trees swooped downward to kiss the fair flowers that sparkle over the glade these lesser trees are of various species they are the sassafras laurel famed for its sanitary sap the noble carolina bay with its aromatic leaves the red mulberry and the singular osage orange tree maclura aurantica the bowwood of the indians the pawpaw also is present to attest the extreme richness of the soil but the flowering plants that flourish in profuse luxuriance over the glade are sufficient evidence of its fertility why the trees grow not there is one of nature's secrets not yet revealed to man it is easier to say why a squatter's cabin is not there there is no mystery about this though there might appear to be since the clearing is found ready to hand the explanation is simple the glade is a mile distant from water the nearest being that of the creek already mentioned as running past the cabin of the squatter thus nature as if jealous of this pretty wild wood garden protects it from the defilement of man nevertheless the human presence is not unknown to it on this very morning this fair morning in may that has disclosed to our view the cabin and clearing of the squatter a man may be observed entering the glade the light elastic step the lithe agile form the smooth face all bespeak of his youth while the style of his dress his arms and equipments proclaim his calling to be that of a hunter he is a man of the correct size and it may be added of the correct shape that is one with whose figure the eye finds no fault it is pleased at beholding a certain just distribution of the members promising strength and activity for the accomplishment of any possible physical end the countenance is equally expressive of good mental qualities the features are regular and open to frankness a prominent chin denotes firmness a soft hazel eye gentleness and a full rounded throat intrepid daring there is neither beard upon the chin nor moustache upon the lip not that the face is too young for either but both have been shaven off in the way of hair a magnificent chevelure of brown curls ruffles out under the rim of the cap shadowing over the cheeks and neck of the wearer arched eyebrows a small mouth and regular teeth 
give the finish to a face which might be regarded as a type of manly beauty and yet this beauty appears under a russet garb there is no evidence of excessive toilet care the brush and comb have been but sparingly used and neither perfume nor pomatum has been employed to heighten the shine of those luxuriant locks there is a suntan on the face that perhaps with the aid of soap might be taken off but it is permitted to remain the teeth too might be made whiter with a dentifrice and brush but in all likelihood the nearest approach to their having ever been cleansed has been while chewing a piece of tough deer meat nevertheless without any artificial aids the young man's beauty proclaims itself in every feature the more so perhaps that in gazing upon his face you are impressed with the idea that there is an outcome in it in his dress there is not much that could be altered for the better the hunting shirt of the finest buckskin leather with its fringed cape and skirt hangs upon his body with all the grace of an athenian tunic while its open front permits to be seen the manly contour of his breast but half concealed under the softer fawn skin the wrappers of green baize though folded more than once around his legs do not hide their elegant tournure and an appropriate covering for his feet is a pair of strong moccasins soled with thick leather a coonskin cap sits high upon his head slightly slouched to the right with the visage of the animal turned to the front and the full plume-like tail with its alternate rings drooping to the shoulder it forms a headdress that is far from ungraceful a belt around the waist a short hunting knife in its sheath a large powder horn hanging below the armpit a bullet pouch underneath and voila tout no not all there remains to be mentioned the rifle the arm par excellence of the american hunter the portrait of frank wingrove a dashing young backwoodsman whose calling is the chase the hunter has entered the glade and is advancing across it he walks slowly but without caution without the habitual stealthy tread that distinguishes the sons of st hubert in the west on the contrary his step is free and the flowers are crushed under his feet he is not even silent but humming a tune as he goes notwithstanding that he appears accoutred for the chase his movements are not those of one in pursuit of game for this morning at least he is out upon a different errand and judging from his jovial aspect it should be one of pleasure the birds themselves seem not more gay on emerging from the shadow of the tall trees into the open glade effulgent with flowers his gaiety seems to have reached its climax it breaks forth in song and for some minutes the forest re-echoes the well-known lay of woodman spare that tree whence this joyous humour why are those eyes sparkling with a scarce concealed triumph is there a sweetheart expected is the glade to the scene of a love interview that glade perfumed and flowery as if designed for such a purpose conjecture is reasonable the young hunter has the air of one who keeps an assignation one too who dreams not of disappointment near the edge of the glade on the side opposite to that by which the hunter has come is a fallen tree its branches and bark have long since disappeared and the trunk is bleached to a brilliant white in the phraseology of the backwoods it is no longer a tree but a log towards this the hunter advances on arriving at the log he seats himself upon it in the attitude of one who does not anticipate being for long alone there is a path that runs across the glade bisecting it in two nearly equal parts it is a tiny track evidently not much used it conducts from the stream on which stands the cabin of the squatter holt to another fork of the same river the obion where clearings are numerous and where there is also a large settlement bearing the dignified title of town it is a town of swampville a name perhaps more appropriate than euphonious upon this path where it debouches from the forest the eye of frank wingrove becomes fixed not in the direction of swampville but towards the clearing of the squatter from this it would appear probable that he expects someone and that the person expected should come from that side a good while passes and yet no one answers his inquiring glance he begins to manifest signs of impatience as if to kill time he repeatedly rises and again reseats himself with his eye he measures the altitude of the sun the watch of the backwoodsman and as the bright orb rises higher in the heavens his spirits appear to sink in proportion his look is no longer cheerful he has long since finished his song and his voice is now heard again only when he utters an ejaculation of impatience all at once the joyous expression is restored there is a noise in the woods and it proceeds from the right direction a rustling of dead leaves that litter the path and occasionally the swish of recoiling branches some one approaches the glade the young hunter springs to his feet and stands listening 
Presently he hears voices, but he hears them rather with surprise than pleasure, as is indicated by another quick change passing over his countenance. The cheerful aspect has again given place to a look of disappointment, this time approaching to chagrin. There's talk going on, mutters he to himself, and she's not alone. There's somebody along with her. Who the darn nation can it be? After this characteristic soliloquy, he remains silent, listening far more eagerly than before. The noises become more distinct, and the voices louder. More than one can be distinguished, mingling in the conversation. For some seconds the hunter maintains his attentive attitude, his eye sternly fixed upon the embouchure of the path. His suspense is of short duration. Hearing the voices more plainly, he recognizes their tones, and the recognition appears to give another sudden turn to his thoughts. The expression of chagrin gives place to one of simple disappointment. "'Bah!' exclaims he, throwing himself back upon the deadwood. "'Tain't her at all. It's only a gang of them roving redskins. What an old Nick's name fetches em this way, and just at a time when they ain't wanted.' After a moment's reflection, he starts up from the log, continuing to mutter, "'I must hide, or they'll be for having a parley. That'd never do, for I guess you can't be far off by this. Hang the crooked luck!' with this elegant finish the speaker glides rapidly round the end of the fallen tree and makes for the nearest underwood evidently with the design of screening himself from sight he is too late as the ugh uttered on the opposite side of the glade convinces him and changing his intention he fronts round and quietly returns to his former position upon the log the hunter's conjecture has proved correct bronzed faces show themselves over the tops of the bushes on the opposite side of the glade and the moment after three indians emerge into the open ground that they are indians their tatterdemalion dress of coloured blankets leggings and moccasins would indicate but their race is even recognisable in their mode of march though there are but three of them and the path runs no longer among the trees they follow one another in single file and in the true typical trot of the red aboriginal the presence of indians in these woods requires explanation for their tribe has long before this time been transported to their new lands west of the mississippi it only needs to be said that a few families have preferred to remain some from attachment to the scenes of their youth not to be severed by the prospect of a far happier home some from associations formed with the whites and some from more trivial causes perhaps from being the degraded outcasts of their tribes throughout the whole region of the backwoods there still exists a sparse population of the indigenous race dwelling as their ancestors did under tents or in the open air trafficking in small articles of their own manufacture in short performing very much the same metier as the gitanos in europe there are other points of resemblance between these two races amounting almost to family likeness and which fairly entitles the indians to an appellation sometimes bestowed upon them the gypsies of the new world the three indians who have entered the glade are manifestly what is termed an indian family or part of one they are father and mother and daughter the last a girl just grown to womanhood the man is in the lead the woman follows and the young girl brings up the rear they are bent upon a journey and its object is also manifest the panier borne upon the back of the woman containing fox and coon skins with little baskets of stained wicker and the bead embroidered moccasins and wampum belts that appear in the hands of the girl bespeak a purposed visit to the settlement of swampville true to the custom of his fathers the indian himself carries nothing if we except a long rusty gun over his shoulder and a small hatchet in his belt rendering him rather a formidable looking fellow on his way to a market End of chapter three chapter four of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter 4. The Catastrophe of a Kiss. The log on which the young hunter had seated himself is some paces distant from the path. He has a slight knowledge of this Indian family, and simply nods to them as they pass. He does not speak, lest a word should bring on a conversation, for the avoidance of which he has a powerful motive the indian makes no halt but strides silently onward followed by his pannier laden squaw the girl however pauses in her steps as if struck by some sudden thought the action quickly follows the thought and turning out of the path she approaches the spot where the hunter is seated what wants she with him 
can this be the she he has been expecting with such impatience surely not and yet the maiden is by no means ill-looking in her gleaming oblique eyes there is a certain sweetness of expression and a tinge of purple red bursting through the bronze of her cheeks lends to her countenance a peculiar charm add to this luxuriant black hair with a bosom of bold outlines which the sparse savage costume but half conceals and you have a portrait of something more than pretty many a time and oft in the history of backwoods life has the heart of the proud pale face offered a sacrifice at such a shrine is this then the expected one no her actions answer that question and his too he does not even rise to receive her but keeps a seat upon the log regarding her approach with a glance of indifference not unmingled with a slight expression of displeasure her object is presently apparent a bullet pouch of white buckskin richly worked with porcupine quills is hanging over her arm on arriving before the hunter she holds it out as if about to present it to him one might fancy that such is her intention and that the pouch is designed as a gauge d'amour but the word dollar which accompanies the offer precludes the possibility of such a supposition it is not thus that an indian girl makes love she is simply soliciting the pale face to purchase in this design she is almost certain to be successful the pouch proclaims its value and promises to sell itself certainly it is a beautiful object with its quills of bright dye and richly embroidered shoulder strap perhaps no object could be held up before the eyes of frank wingrove more likely to elicit his admiration he sees and admires he knows its value it is cheap at a dollar besides he was just thinking of treating himself to such a one his old catskin is worn and greasy he has grown fastidious of late for reasons that may be guessed this beautiful pouch would sit well over his new hunting shirt and trick him out to a tea in the eyes of marion his desire to become the possessor of the coveted article hinders him from continuing the reflection fortunately his old pouch contains the required coin and in another instant a silver dollar glances in the palm of the indian girl but the goods are not delivered over in the ordinary manner a thought seems to strike the fair huckster and she stands for a moment gazing upon the face of the handsome purchaser is it curiosity or is it perhaps some softer emotion that has suddenly germinated in her soul her hesitation lasts only for an instant with a smile that seems to solicit she approaches nearer to the hunter the pouch is held aloft with the strap extended between her hands her design is evident she purposes to adjust it upon his shoulders the young hunter does not repel the preferred service how could he it would not be frank wingrove to do so on the contrary he leans his body forward to aid in the action the attitude brings their faces almost close together their lips are within two inches of touching for a moment the girl appears to have forgotten her purpose or else she executes it in a manner sufficiently maladroit in passing the strap over the high coonskin cap her fingers become entangled in the brown curls beneath her eyes are not directed that way they are gazing with a basilic glance into the eyes of the hunter the attitude of wingrove is at first shrinking but a slight smile curling upon his lip betokens that there is not much pain in the situation a reflection however made at the moment chases away the smile it is this turn all earthquakes were marion to see me now she'd never believe but that i'm in love with this young squaw she's been jealous of her already but the reflection passes and with it for an instant the remembrance of marion the sweetest smelling flower is that which is nearest so sings the honey-bee human blood cannot bear the proximity of those pretty lips and the kindness of the indian maiden must be recompensed by a kiss she makes no resistance she utters no cry their lips meet but the kiss is interrupted ere it can be achieved the bark of a dog followed by a half-suppressed scream in a female voice causes the interruption the hunter starts back looking aghast the indian exhibits only surprise both together glance across the glade marion holt is standing upon its opposite edge wingrove's cheek has turned red fear and shame are depicted upon his face in his confusion he pushes the indian aside more rudely than gently go he exclaims in an under voice god sake go you've ruined me the girl obeys the request and gesture both sufficiently rude after such sweet complaisance she obeys however and moves off from the spot not without reproach in her glance and reluctance in her steps before reaching the path she pauses turns in her track 
and glides swiftly back towards the hunter wingrove stands astonished half affrighted before he can recover himself or divine her intent the indian is once more by his side she snatches the pouch from his shoulders the place where her own hands had suspended it then flinging the silver coin at his feet and uttering in a loud angry tone the words false pale face she turns from the spot and glides rapidly away in another moment she has entered the forest path and is lost to sight the scene has been short of only a few seconds duration marian has not moved since the moment she uttered that wild half-suppressed scream she stands silent and transfixed as if its utterance had deprived her of speech and motion her fine form picturesquely draped with bodice and skirt the moccasin buckskins upon her feet the coiled coronet of shining hair surmounting her head the rifle in her hand resting on its butt as if it had been dashed mechanically down the huge gaunt dog by her side all these outlined upon the green background of the forest leaves impart to the maiden an appearance at once majestic and imposing standing thus immobile she suggests the idea of some rival huntress whom diana from jealousy has suddenly transformed into stone but her countenance betrays that she is no statue the colour of her cheeks alternately flushing red and pale and the indignant flash of that fiery eye tell you that you look upon a living woman one who breathes and burns under the influence of a terrible emotion wingrove is half frantic he scarce knows what to say or what to do in his confusion he advances toward the girl calling her by name but before he has half crossed the glade her words fall upon his ear causing him to hesitate and falter in his steps frank wingrove she cries come not near me your road lies the other way go follow your indian damsel you will find her at swampville no doubt selling her cheap kisses to triflers like yourself traitor we meet no more without waiting for a reply or even to note the effect of her words marian holt steps back into the forest and disappears the young hunter is too stupefied to follow with false pale face ringing in one ear and traitor in the other he knows not in what direction to turn at length the log falls under his eye and striding mechanically towards it he sits down to reflect upon the levity of his conduct and the unpleasant consequences of an unhallowed kiss end of chapter four chapter five of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter 5. Squatter and Saint. Return we to the squatter's cabin, this time to enter it. Inside there is not much to be seen or described. The interior consists of a single room, of which the log walls are the sides, and the clapboard roof the ceiling. In one corner there is a little partition or screen, the materials composing it being skins of the black bear and fallow deer. It is pleasant to look upon this little chamber. It is the shrine of modesty and virgin innocence. Its presence proves that the squatter is not altogether a savage. Rude as is the interior of the dwelling, it contains a few relics of bygone better days, not spent there, but elsewhere. Some books are seen upon a little shelf, the library of Lillian's mother, and two or three pieces of furniture that have once been decent if not stylish but chattels of this land are scarce in the backwoods even in the houses of more pretentious people than a squatter and a log stool or two a table of split poplar planks an iron pot some pans and pails of tin a few plates and pannikins of the same material a gourd dipper or drinking cup and half a dozen common knives forks and spoons constitute the whole plenishing of the hut the skin of a cougar not long killed hangs against the wall beside it are the pelts of other wild animals as the gray fox the raccoon the rufous lynx muskrats and minks these draping the roughly hewn logs rob them to some extent of their rigidity by the door is suspended an old saddle of the fashion known as american a sort of cross between the high-peaked scylla of the mexicans and the flat pad like english saddle on the adjacent peg hangs a bridle to match its reins black with age and its bit reddened with rust some light articles of female apparel are seen hanging against the wall 
near that sacred precinct where during the night hours reposed the fair daughters of the squatter the cabin is a rude dwelling indeed a rough casket to contain a pair of jewels so sparkling and priceless just now it is occupied by two individuals of a very different character two men already mentioned the hunter hickman holt and his visitor joshua stebbins the schoolmaster of swampville the personal appearance of the latter has been already half described it deserves a more detailed delineation his probable age has been stated about thirty his spare figure and ill-omened aspect have been alluded to add to this low stature a tripe-coloured skin a beardless face a shrinking chin a nose sharp-pointed and peckish lank black hair falling over the forehead and hanging down almost low enough to shadow a pair of deep-set weasel-like eyes given to this combination of features a slightly sinister aspect and you have the portrait of joshua stebbins it is not easy to tell the cause of this sinister expression for the features are not irregular and but for its bilious colour the face could scarcely be determined ill-looking the eyes do not squint the thin lips appear making a constant effort to look smiling and saint-like perhaps it is this outward affectation of the saintly character belying as it evidently does the spirit within that produces the unfavourable impression in earlier youth the face may have been better favoured but a career spent in the exercise of evil passions has left more than one blaze upon it it is difficult to reconcile such a career with the demeanour of the man and especially with his present occupation but joshua stebbins has not always been a schoolmaster and the pedagogue of a border settlement is not necessarily expected to be a model of morality even if it were so this lord of the hickory switch is comparatively a stranger in swampville and perhaps only the best side of his character has been exhibited to the parents and guardians of the settlement this is of the saintly order and as if to strengthen the illusion a dress of clerical cut has been assumed and also a white cravat and black boat-brimmed hat the coat waistcoat and trousers are of broadcloth though not of the finest quality it is just such a costume as might be worn by one of the humbler class of methodist border ministers or by a catholic priest a somewhat rarer bird in the backwoods joshua stebbins is neither one nor the other although as will shortly appear his assumption of the ecclesiastical style is not altogether confined to his dress of late he has also affected the clerical calling the ci devant attorney's clerk while the schoolmaster of swampville is now an apostle of the latter-day saints the character is new the faith itself is not very old for the events we are relating occurred during the first decade of the mormon revelation even holt himself has not yet been made aware of the change as would appear from a certain air of astonishment with which at first sight he regards the clerical habiliments of his visitor it would be difficult to imagine a greater contrast than that presented in the appearance of these two men were we to select two parallel types from the animal world they would be the sly fox and the grizzly bear the latter represented by the squatter himself in hickman holt we behold a personage of unwonted aspect a man of gigantic stature with a beard reaching to the second button of his coat and a face not to be looked upon without a sensation of terror a countenance expressive of determined courage but at the same time a fierceness untempered by any trace of a softer emotion a shaggy sand-coloured beard slightly grizzled eyebrows like a chevaux de frise of hogs bristles eyes of a greenish grey and a broad livid scar across the left cheek are component parts in producing this aspect while a red cotton kerchief wound turban-like around the head and pulled low down in front renders its expression more palpable and pronounced a loose surtout of thick green blanket cloth somewhat faded and worn adds to the colossal appearance of the man while a red flannel shirt serves him also for a vest his huge limbs are encased in pantaloons of blue kentucky jeans but these are scarcely visible as the skirt of his ample coat drapes down so as to cover the tops of a pair of rough horse-skin boots that reach upwards to his knees the costume is common enough on the banks of the mississippi the colossal form is not rare but the fierce and somewhat repulsive countenance that is more individual is this the father of marion and lillian is it possible from so rude a stem could spring such graceful branches flowers so fair and lovely 
if so then must the mothers of both have been beautiful beyond common it is even true and true that both were beautiful wherefore they are gone and hickman holt is twice a widower long ago he buried the half-blood mother of marion and at a later period though still some years ago her gentle golden-haired successor was carried to an early grave the latter event occurred in one of the settlements nearer to the region of civilized life there was a murmur of mystery about the second widowhood of hickman holt which only became hushed on his moving further west to the wild forest where we now find him here no one knows aught of his past life or history one only excepted and that is the man who is to-day his visitor contrasting the two men regarding the superior size and more formidable aspect of the owner of the cabin you would expect his guest to make some show of obeisance to him on the contrary it is the squatter who exhibits the appearance of complacence he has already saluted his visitor with an air of embarrassment but ill-concealed under the words of welcome with which he received him throughout the scene of salutation and afterwards the schoolmaster has maintained his characteristic demeanour of half-smiling half-sneering coolness noting the behaviour of these two men to one another even a careless observer could perceive that the smaller man is the master end of chapter five Chapter Six of the Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed. Chapter Six. An Apostolic Effort. The morning needed no fire, but there were embers upon the clay hearth some smouldering ends of faggots over which the breakfast had been cooked on one side of the fireplace the squatter placed a stool for his visitor and then another for himself as if mechanically on the opposite side a table of rough-hewn planks stood between on this was a bottle containing maize corn whisky or bald face as it is more familiarly known in the backwoods two cracked cups to drink out of a couple of corn-cob pipes and some black tobacco all these preparations had been made beforehand and confirmed what had dropped from the lips of lillian that the visitor had been expected beyond the customary phrases of salutation not a word was exchanged between the host and guest until both had seated themselves the squatter then commenced the conversation you've had a long ride josh said he leaning towards the table and clutching hold of the bottle Joy a taste o this hair rock gut tain't the daintiest a drink to offer a man so genteelly dressed as you air this morning but there's was liquor in these her buck woods i reckon will you mix there's water in dat jug dar no water for me was the laconic reply you're right bout dat it's from old hatcher's still where they used to lay put the water in afore they give you the liquor i suppose you do it to save a feller the trouble of mixin <laughs> the squatter laughed at his own jest mot not as if he enjoyed it to any great extent but rather as if desirous of putting his visitor in good humour the only evidence of his success was a dry smile that curled upon the thin lip of the saint rather sarcastically than otherwise there was silence while both drank and holt was again under the necessity of beginning the conversation as already observed he had noticed the altered style of the schoolmaster's costume and it was to this transformation that his next speech alluded why josh said he attempting an easy off-hand style of talk you're brand new spick span from head to foot you look for all the world just like one of them american critters of preachers i often see prowling about swampville darn it man what dodge air you up to now you ain't got religion i reckon i have gravely responded stebbins hoorah <laughs> oh, what sort of thing is anyhow my religion is of the right sort brother holt methody not of the kind what then i thought they were all methodies in swampville they're all gentiles in swampville worse than infidels themselves well i know they brag mightily on their gentility i reckon you're about right there them storekeepers are stuck up in a fightin thing no no it's not that i mean my religion has nothing to do with swampville thank the lord for his mercy i've been led into a sure way of salvation i suppose brother holt you've heard of the new revelation hear another new revelation all i don't know as i have what's the name it the book of mormon 
oh mormons i hearn of them ain't they been a fightin a spell up thar in Missouri or illinois where they built em grand ferris temple i've hearn some talk o it at nevoo it is even so brother holt the wicked gentiles have been persecuting the saints just as their fathers were persecuted by the egyptian pharaohs and hain't they killed their head man smith he were called if i recollects right alas true joseph smith has been made a martyr and is by this time an angel in heaven no doubt he is now in glory at the head of the angelic host well if the angels are weemen he'll have a good ween of em about him i reckon i've hearn he were at the head of a pretty considerable host of em up there in Missouri. fifty wise i say head or that er true josh scandal brother holt all scandal of the wicked enemies of our faith they were but wives in the spirit that the gentiles can't comprehend since their eyes have not been opened by the revelation well appears to be tolerable free sort of religion anyhow kind of turk ain't it nothing of the kind it has nothing in common with the doctrines of mohammedism but whar did you get it josh stebbins who gin it to you do you remember the man i brought over here last fall certain i do young he were brig young i think you called him the same in course i remember him well enough but i reckon our marion do a little better he tried to spark the girl and made fine speeches to her but she could bar a sight of him for all that ha <laughs> ha don't you recollect that trick that our minx played on him she unbuckled the girt of his saddle just as he were a-going to mount and down he came saddle-bags and all cowall up to the earth <laughs> arter he were gone i larfed till i were like the bust you did wrong hickman holt to encourage your daughter in her sauciness had you known the man that man sir was a prophet a prophet yes the greatest perhaps the world ever saw a man in direct communication with the almighty himself lord twain't joe smith were it no but one as great as he one who has inherited his spirit and who is now the head of all the saints dat feller at der head you astonish me josh stebbins ah well you may be astonished that man has astonished me hickman holt he has turned me from evil ways and led me to fear the lord the squatter looked incredulous but remained silent yes that same man who was here with me in your humble cabin is now chief priest of the mormon church he has laid his hands on this poor head and constituted me one of his humble apostles yes one of the twelve entrusted with spreading the true faith of the saints over all the world who law for you josh stubbins you'll be just a man for that sort of thing you got the learning for it ain't you no doubt brother holt with the help of the lord my humble acquirements will be useful for though he only can open for us poor sinners the kingdom of grace he suffers such weak instruments as myself to point out the narrow path that leads to it just as with the philistines of old the hearts of the gentiles are hardened like flint stones and refuse to receive the true faith unlike the followers of mohammed we propagate not by sword but by the influence of ratiocination what ratiocination what might that be reason reason oh common sense you means i suppose exactly so reasoning that produces conviction and i flatter myself that being gifted with some little sense and skill my efforts may be crowned with success old oh, josh without talking of common sense you have good grist a lawyer sense that i know and so i suppose you have took it into your head to make beginning on me ain't that why you have come over this morning what to make a mormon of me up to this time the conversation had been carried on in a somewhat stiff and irrelevant manner this more especially on the side of the squatter who notwithstanding his endeavours to assume an air of easy nonchalance was evidently labouring under suspicion and constraint from the fact of stebbins having sent a message to forewarn him of this visit he knew that the schoolmaster had some business with him of more than usual importance and it was a view to ascertain the nature of this business and relieve himself from suspense that the interrogatory was put he would have been right glad to have received an answer in the affirmative since it would have cost him little concern to turn mormon or profess to do so notwithstanding his pretended opposition to the faith he was half indulging himself in the hope that this might be the errand on which stebbins had come 
as was evinced by a more cheerful expression on his countenance but as the saint lingered long before making a reply the shadows of suspicion again darkened over the brow of the squatter and with a nervous uneasiness he awaited the answer it'll be a tough job josh said he with an effort to appear unconcerned a tough job mind you well so i should expect answered the apostle dryly and just for that reason i don't intend to undertake it though i should like brother holt to see you gathered into the fold i know our great high priest would make much of a man like you the saints have many enemies and need strong arms and stout hearts such as yours hickman holt the lord has given to his prophet the right to defend the true faith even with carnal weapons if others fail and woe be to them who make war on us let them dread the destroying angels the destroying angels what sort of critters be they they are the Danites. well i'm just as wise as ever josh dod rot it man don't be mystifarious who air the Danites? i should like to know you can only know them by initiation and you should know them you're just the man to be one of them and i have no doubt you'd be made one as soon as you joined us the apostle paused as if to note the effect of his words but the colossal hunter appeared as if he had not heard them it was not that he did not comprehend their meaning but rather because he was not heeding what had been said his mind being occupied with a presentiment of some more unpleasant proposal held in reserve by his visitor he remained silent however leaving it to the latter to proceed to the declaration of his design the suspicions of the squatter if directed to anything connected with his family affairs were well grounded and soon received confirmation after a pause the mormon continued no hickman holt it ain't with you my business lies to-day that is not exactly with you who then your daughter end of chapter six chapter seven of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter seven the mormon's demand a shudder passed through the herculean frame of the hunter though it was scarcely perceptible from the effort he made to conceal it it was noticed for all that and the emotion that caused it perfectly understood the keen eye of the ci devant law clerk was too skilled in reading the human countenance to be deceived by an effort at impassibility my daughter muttered holt half interrogatively your daughter echoed the mormon with imperturbable coolness well which of em there's two oh you know which i mean marion of course and what do you want with marion josh come brother holt it's no use of your feigning ignorance i've spoken to you of this before you know well enough what i want with her darn me if i do i remember what you said afore but i tort you were only joking i was in earnest then hickman holt and i'm still more in earnest now i want a wife and i think marion would suit me admirably i suppose you know that the saints have moved off from illinois and are now located beyond the rocky mountains oh you've heard something what well i propose going there to join them and i must take a wife with me for no man is welcome who comes there without one yes drawled the squatter with a bitter smile and from what i've hearn i reckon he'd be more welcome if he fetched a half dozen nonsense hickman holt i wonder a man of your sense would listen to such lies it's a scandal that's been scattered abroad by a set of corrupt priests and methody preachers who are jealous of us because we're drawing their people sheer wicked lies every word of it well i don't know about that but i know one thing to a certainty you will never get marion's consent i don't want marion's consent that don't signify so long as i have yours mine ay yours and i must have it look here hickman holt listen to me we're making too long a talk about this business and i have no time to waste in words i have made everything ready and shall leave for the salt lake before three more days have passed over my head the caravan i'm going with is to start from fort smith on the arkansas and it'll be prepared by the time i get there to move over the plains i've bought me a team and a wagon it's already loaded and packed and there's a corner in it left expressly for your daughter therefore she must go 
the tone of the speaker had suddenly changed from that of saintly insinuation to bold open menace the squatter notwithstanding his fierce and formidable aspect did not dare to reply in the same strain he was evidently cowed and suffering under some fearful apprehension must go he muttered half involuntarily as if echoing the other's words yes must and shall i tell you josh stebbins she'll never consent and i tell you hickman holt i don't want her consent that i leave to you to obtain and if you can't get it otherwise you must force it bah what is it for a good husband a good home plenty of meat drink and dress for don't you get it into your fancy that the latter-day saints resemble your canting hypocrites of other creeds who think they please god by their miserable penances quite the reverse i can assure you we mean to live as god intended men should live eat drink and be merry look there the speaker exhibited a handful of shining gold pieces that's the way our church provides for its apostles your daughter will be a thousand times better off there than in this wretched hovel perhaps she will not mind the change so much as you appear to think i know many a first-rate girl that would be glad of the chance i know she won't give in far less to be made a mormon of i hearn her speak again em. i say again she must give in after all you needn't tell her i'm a mormon she needn't know anything about that let her think i'm only moving out west to, to oregon where there are plenty of respectable emigrants now going she'll not suspect anything in that once out at salt lake city she'll soon get reconciled to mormon life i guess the squatter remained silent for some moments his head hanging forward over his broad breast his eyes turned inward as if searching within his bosom for some thought to guide and direct him in there no doubt a terrible struggle was going on a tumult of mixed emotions he loved his daughter and would leave her to her own will but he feared this saintly suitor and dared not gainsay him it must have been some dread secret or fiendish scheme that enabled this small and significant man to sway the will of such a giant a considerable time passed and still the squatter vouchsafed no answer he was evidently wavering as to the nature of the response he should make twice or thrice he raised his head stealthily directing his glance to the countenance of his visitor but only to read in the looks of the latter a fixed and implacable purpose there was no mercy there all at once a change came over the colossus a resolution of resistance had arisen within him and was evinced by his altered attitude and the darkening shadow upon his countenance the triumphant glances of the pseudo saint appeared to have provoked him more than the matter in dispute like the buffalo of the plains stung with indian arrows or the great mysticetus of the deep goaded by the harpoon of the whaler all the angry energies of his nature appeared suddenly aroused from their lethargy and he sprang to his feet towering erect in the presence of his tormentor damnation cried he striking the floor with his heavy heel she won't do it she won't and she shan't keep cool hickman rejoined the mormon without moving from his seat keep cool i expected this but it's all bluster i tell you she will and she shall have a care josh devins have a care what you're about you don't know what you may drive me to but i know what i may lead you to interrupted the other with a sneering smile what involuntarily inquired holt the gallows laconically answered stebbins divils and damnation this emphatic rejoinder was accompanied with a furious grinding of teeth but with a certain recoiling as if the angry spirit of the giant could still be stayed by such a menace it's no use swearing about it holt continued the mormon after a certain time had passed in silence my mind's made up the girl must go with me say yes or no if yes then all's well well for your daughter and well for you too i shall be out of your way salt lake's a long distance off and it's not likely you'll ever set eyes on me again you understand me the saint pronounced these last words with a significant emphasis and then paused as if to let them have their full weight they appeared to produce an effect on hearing them a gleam like a sudden flash of sunlight passed over the countenance of the squatter it appeared the outward index of some consolatory thought freshly conceived and its continuance proved that it was influencing him to take a different view of the mormon's proposal he spoke at length but no longer in the tone of rage for his passion seemed to have subsided as speedily as it had sprung up and suppose i say no 
why in that case i shall not start so soon as i had intended i shall stay in the settlements till i have performed a duty that for a long time i have left undone what duty is it you mean one i owe to society and which i have perhaps sinfully neglected bringing a murderer to justice hush josh gibbons for heaven's sake speak low you know it isn't true but hush the girls are thout don't let em hear such talk perhaps continued stebbins without heeding the interruption perhaps that murderer fancies he might escape he is mistaken if he do one word from me in swampville and the hounds of the law would be upon him ah if he could even get clear of them he could not escape out of my power i have told you i am an apostle of the great mormon church and that man would be cunning indeed who could shun the vengeance of our destroying angels now hickman holt which is it to be yes or no the pause was ominous for poor marian the answer decided her doom it was delivered in a hoarse husky voice yes yes she may go End of chapter seven chapter eight of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter eight a splendid pension the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo was followed by an extensive de beaumont which sent many thousands of sabres ringing back into their scabbards some of them soon after to spring forth in the cause of freedom calumniously called filibustering others perhaps destined never to be drawn again using a figurative expression not a few were converted into spades and in this pacific fashion carried to the far shores of the pacific ocean there to delve for california gold while still others were suspended in the counting-house or the studio to rust in inglorious idleness a three years campaign under the sultry skies of mexico drawing out the war fever that had long burned in the bosoms of the american youth had satisfied the ambition of most it was only those who arrived late upon the field too late to pluck a laurel who would have prolonged the strife the narrator of this tale edward warfield ci devant captain of a corps of rangers was not one of the last mentioned with myself as with many others the great mexican campaign was but the continuation of the little war le petit guerre that had long held an intermittent existence upon the borders of texas and in which we had borne part and the provincial laurels there reap when interwoven with the fresher and greener bays gathered upon the battlefields of anuak constituted a wreath exuberant enough to content us for the time for my part notwithstanding the portentous sound of my ancestral patronymic i was tired of the toils of war and really desired a spell of peace during which i might indulge in the dolce far niente and obtain for my wearied spirit a respite of repose my wishes were in similitude with those of the poet who longed for a lodge of some vast wilderness some boundless contiguity of shade or perhaps more akin to those of that other poet of less solitary inclinings who only desired the desert as a dwelling-place with one fair spirit for his minister in truth i felt a strong inclination for the latter description of life and 
in all likelihood would have made a trial of it but for the interference of one of those ill-starred contingencies that often embarrass the best intentions a phrase of common occurrence will explain the circumstance that offered opposition to my will want of the wherewith to support a wife i had been long enough in the wilderness to know that even a dwelling in the desert cannot be maintained without expense and that however pure the desert air the fairest spirit would require something more substantial to live upon under this prudential view of the case marriage was altogether out of the question we de bon day were dismissed without pension the only reward for our warlike achievements being a piece of land scrip good for the number of acres upon the face of it to be selected from government land wherever the holder might choose to locate the scrip was far greater or less amount according to the term of the receiver's service mine represented a section of six hundred and forty acres worth in ordinary times a dollar and quarter per acre but just then on account of the market being flooded by similar paper reduced to less than half its value with this magnificent bounty was i rewarded for services that perhaps some day might be never mind thank heaven for blessing me with the comforting virtues of humility and contentment this bit of scrip then a tried steed that had carried me many a long mile and through the smoke of more than one red fray a true rifle that i had myself carried equally as far a pair of colt's pistols and a steel toledo taken at the storming of chapultepec constituted the bulk of my available property add to this a remnant of my last month's pay in truth not enough to provide me with that much coveted article a civilian's suit in proof of which my old undress frock with its yellow spread eagle buttons clung to my shoulders like a second shirt of nessus the vanity of wearing a uniform that may have once been felt was long ago threadbare as the coat itself and yet i was not wanting in friends who fancied that it might still exist how little understood they the real state of the case and how much did they misconstrue my involuntary motives it was just to escape from such unpleasant associations that i held on to my scrip most of my brother officers had sold theirs for a song and spent the proceeds upon a supper in relation to mine i had other views than parting with it to the greedy speculators it promised me that very wilderness home i was in search of and having no prospect of procuring a fair spirit for my minister i determined to locate without one i was at the time staying in tennessee the guest of a campaigning comrade and still older friend he was grandson of that gallant leader who with a small band of only forty families ventured three hundred miles through the heart of the bloody ground and founded nashville upon the bold bluffs of an almost unknown river from the lips of their descendants i had heard so many thrilling tales of adventures experienced by this pioneer band that tennessee had become in my fancy a region of romance other associations had led me to love this hospitable and chivalric state and i resolved that within its boundaries 
i should make my home a visit to the land office of nashville ended in my selection of section nine township as my future plantation it was represented to me as a fertile spot situated in the western reserve near the banks of the beautiful obion and not far from the confluence of this river with the mississippi the official believed that there had been some improvement made upon the land by a squatter but whether the squatter still lived upon it he could not tell at all events the fellow will be too poor to exercise a preemption right and of course must move off so spoke the land agent this would answer admirably although my texan experience had constituted me a tolerable woodsman it had not made me a woodcutter and the clearing of the squatter however small it might be would serve as a beginning i congratulated myself on my good luck and without further parley parted with my script receiving in return the necessary documents that constituted me the legal owner and lord of the soil of section nine the only additional information the agent could afford me was that my new purchase was all heavily timbered with the exception before referred to that the township in which it was situated was called swampville and that the section itself was known as holt's clearing from the name it was supposed that the squatter who had made the improvement with this intelligence in my head and the title deeds in my pocket i took leave of the friendly official who at parting politely wished me a pleasant time of it on my new plantation End of chapter eight chapter nine of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter nine friendly advice on returning to the house of my friend i informed him of my purchase and was pleased to find that he approved of it you can't be taken in said he by land upon the opium from what i have heard of it it is one of the most fertile spots in tennessee moreover as you are fond of hunting you'll find game in abundance the black bear and even the panther or painter as our backwoodsmen have it are still common in the obion bottom and indeed all throughout the forests of the reserve i'm rejoiced to hear it no doubt continued my friend with a smile you may shoot deer from your own door or trap wolves and wildcats at the entrance to your hen roost good oh yes though i can't promise that you will see anything of venus in the woods you may enjoy to your heart's content the noble art of venery the obion bottom is a very paradise for hunters it was it that gave birth to the celebrated crockett on that account it will be all the more interesting to me and from what you say it is just the sort of place i should have chosen to squat upon by the by interrupted my friend looking a little grave as he spoke your making use of that familiar phrase recalls the circumstance you mentioned just now did i understand you to say there was a squatter on the land there was one so the agent has told me but whether he be still squatted there the official could not say rather awkward if he be rejoined my friend in a sort of musing soliloquy while with his eyes fixed upon the ground he kept pulling his goatee to its full length in what way awkward i asked in some surprise how can that signify oh a great deal these squatters are queer fellows ugly customers to deal with especially when you come to turn them out of their house and home as they consider it it is true they have the preemption right that is they may purchase if they please and send you to seek a location elsewhere but this is a privilege those gentry rarely please to indulge in being universally too poor to purchase what then their motto is for him to keep who can 
the old adage possession being nine points of the law is in the squatter's code no dead letter i can assure you do you mean that the fellow might refuse to turn out it depends a good deal on what sort of a fellow he is they are not all alike if he should chance to be one of the obstinate and pugnacious kind you are likely enough to have trouble with him but surely the law will aid you in ousting him that's what you were going to say i should expect so in tennessee at all events and you would be disappointed in almost any other part of the state you might rely upon legal assistance but i fear that about swampville you will find society not very different from that you have encountered on the borders of texas and you know how little help the law could afford you there in the enforcement of such a claim then i must take the law into my own hands rejoined i falling into very old-fashioned phraseology for i was beginning to feel indignant at the very idea of this prospective difficulty no warfield replied my sober friend do not take that course i know you are not the man to be scared out of your rights but in the present case prudence is the proper course to follow your squatter if there be one it is to be hoped that like many of our grand cities he has only an existence on the map but if there should be a real live animal of this description on the ground he will be almost certain to have neighbors some half dozen of his own kidney living at greater or less distances around him they are not usually of clannish disposition but in a matter of this kind they will be as unanimous in their sympathies and antipathies too as they would about the butchering of a bear turn one of them out by force either legal or otherwise and it would be like bringing a hornet's nest about your ears even were you to succeed in so clearing your land you would find ever afterwards a set of very unpleasant neighbors to live among i know some cases in point that occurred nearer home here in fact some wild lands of my own have had an instance of the kind what then am i to do can you advise me do as others have often done before you and who have actually been forced to the course of action i shall advise should there be a squatter and one likely to prove obstinate approach him as gently as you can and state your case frankly you will find this the best mode of treating with these fellows many of whom have a dash of honour as well as honesty in their composition speak of the improvements he has made and offer him a recompense ah friend blount replied i addressing my kind host by his baptismal name it is much easier to listen to your advice than follow it come old comrade rejoined he after a momentary pause i think i understand you there need be no concealment between friends such as we are let not that difficulty hinder you from following the course i have recommended the old general's property is not all gone yet and should you stand in need of a hundred or two to make a second purchase of your plantation send me word and thanks blount thanks it is just as i should have expected but i shall not become your debtor for such a purpose i have been a frontiersman too long to be bullied by a backwoodsman there now warfield just your own passion itself nay you must take my advice pray do not go rashly about it but act as i have counselled you that will depend upon contingencies should master holt for i believe that is my predecessor's name should he prove amiable i may consent to go a little in your debt and pay him for whatever log-chopping he has done if otherwise by the lady of guadalupe you remember our old mexican shibboleth he shall be cleared out of his clearing sans facon perhaps we have been wasting words upon an ideal existence perhaps there is no squatter after all and or that old holt has long since gone under and only his ghost will be found flitting around the precincts of this disputed territory would not that be an interesting companion for my hours of midnight loneliness a match for the wolves and wildcats <laughs> well old comrade i trust it may turn out no worse the ghost of a squatter might prove a less unpleasant neighbour than the squatter himself dispossessed of his squatment now withstanding this badinage i know you will act with judgment and you can count upon my help in the matter if you should require it i grasped the speaker's hand to express my gratitude and the tight pressure returned told me i was parting with one of the few friends i had in the world my impedimenta had been already packed they did not need much stowage a pair of saddlebags was sufficient to contain all my personal property including the title deeds of my freehold my arms i carried upon my person my sword only being strapped along the saddle bidding adieu to my friend i mounted my noble arab and heading him to the road commenced journeying toward the western reserve End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of the Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter 10 a classic land between nashville and swampville extends a distance of more than a hundred miles just three days travel on horseback for the first ten miles the harpeth river i found an excellent road graded and mechanized running most of the way between fenced plantations my next point was paris and forty miles further on i arrived in dresden so far as the nomenclature was concerned i might have fancied myself travelling upon the continent of europe by going a little to the right i might have entered asia since i was told of smyrna and troy being at no great distance in that direction and by proceeding in a southwesterly course i should have passed through denmark and landed at memphis certainly an extensive tour within the short distance of three days Ugh, those ugly names what hedge schoolmaster has scattered them so loosely and profusely over this lovely land whipped the wretch with rattlesnakes memphis indeed as if memphis with its monolithic statues needed commemoration on the banks of the mississippi a new osiris a new sphinx half horse half alligator with a sprinkling of the snapping turtle at every forking of the roads whenever i inquired my way in my ears rang these classic homonyms till my soul was sick of sounds swamp fell was euphony and mud creek soft music in comparison beyond dresden the titles became more appropriate and much more rare there were long stretches having no names at all for the simple reason that there were no places to bear them the numerous creeks however had been baptized and evidently by the backwoodsmen themselves as the titles indicated deer creek and mud coon and cat big and little forky told that the pioneers who first explored the hydrographic system of the western reserve were not heavily laden with classic lore and a pity it is that pedantry should be permitted to alter the simple but expressive and appropriate appellatives by them bestowed unfortunately the system is followed up to this hour by the fremonts and other pseudo explorers of the farthest west the soft and harmonious sound of indian and spanish nomenclature as well as the more striking titles bestowed by the trappers are rapidly being obliterated from the maps their places to be supplied at the instigation of fulsome flattery by the often vulgar names of demagogic leaders or the influential heads of the employing bureau i know the old general will be pleased perhaps reciprocate the compliment in his next dispatch if i call this beautiful river smith how the secretary will smile when he sees his name immortalized upon my map by a lake never to be dried up and which hereafter is to be known by the elegant and appropriate appellation of jones under such influence are these absurd titles bestowed and the consequence is that amid the romantic defiles of the rocky mountains we have our ears jarred by a jumble of petty and most inappropriate names smiths 
Joneses, Jameses, and the like, while from the sublime peaks of the Cascade Range we have Adams, Jackson, Jefferson, Madison, and Washington, overlooking the limitless waters of the Pacific. This last series we could excuse. The possession of high qualities, or the achievement of great deeds, ennobles even a common name, and all these have been stamped with the true patent. In the associated thoughts that cling around them, we take no note of the sound, whether it be harsh or harmonious. But that is another question, and must not hinder us from entering our protest against the nomenclature of Smith, Jones, and Robinson. Beyond Dresden, my road could no longer be termed a road. It was a mere trace or lane cut out in the forest, with here and there a tree blazed to indicate the direction as i neared the point of my destination i became naturally curious to learn something about it that is about swampville since it was evident that this was to be the point du puy of my future efforts at colonization my depot and port entry i should have inquired had i found any one to inquire from but for ten miles along the road i encountered not a human creature then only a darky with an ox-cart loaded with wood but despairing of information from such a source i declined detaining him the only intelligence i was able to draw from the negro was that the city old swampville massa he lay about ten mile fur down the creek. The ten mile down the creek proved to be long ones, but throughout the whole distance I saw not a creature, until I had arrived within a mile or so of the settlement. I had already been apprised that Swampville was a new place. Its fame had not yet reached the eastern world, and even in Nashville it was unknown except perhaps to the land office it was only after entering the reserve that i became fully assured of its existence and there it was known as a settlement rather than a city for all that swampville proved to be not so contemptible a place and the reason i had encountered so little traffic while approaching it was that i had been coming in the wrong direction in other words i had approached it from behind swampville was in reality a riverine town <clears throat> to it the east was back country and its front face was to the west in that direction lay its world and the ways that opened to it log shanties began to line the road standing thicker as i advanced while at intervals appeared a frame house of more pretentious architecture in front of one of these the largest of the collection there stood a tall post or rather a tree with its top cut off and divested of its lower branches on the head of this was a martin box and underneath the dwelling of the birds a broad framed board on which was legible the word hotel a portrait of jackson done in continental uniform embellished the face of the board the sign seemed little appropriate for in the harsh features of old hickory there was but slight promise of hospitality it was no use going farther the jackson hotel was evidently the head inn of the place and without pause or parley i dismounted at its door i was too well used to western habits to wait either for welcome or assistance too careful of my arab to trust him to hands unskilled 
and I did the unsaddling myself. A half-naked negro gave me some slight help in the grooming process, all the while exhibiting his ivories and the whites of his eyes in an expression of ill-concealed astonishment, produced, apparently, by the presence of my uniform coat. To the darky, no doubt, an uncommon apparition. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter 11. The Jackson Hotel. I found that I had arrived in the very nick of time, for just as I returned from the stable and was entering the veranda of the hotel, I heard the bell calling its guests to supper. There was no ado made about me. Neither landlord or waiter met me with a word, and following the stream of boarders or travellers who had arrived before me, I took my seat at the common table d'hôte. Had the scene been new to me, I might have found food for reflection, or observed circumstances to astonish me, but I had been long accustomed to mix in as motley a throng as that which now surrounded the table of the Swampville Hotel. A supper-table encircled by blanket and jeans coats, by buckskin blouses and red flannel shirts, by men without coats at all, was nothing strange to me, nor was it strange either to find these bizarre costumes interspersed among others of fashionable cut and finest cloth. Black broadcloth frocks and satin or velvet vests were quite common individuals thus attired formed a majority of the guests for in young settlements the hotel or tavern is also a boarding-house where the spruce storekeepers and better class of clerks take their meals usually sleeping in the officer's door in glancing around the table i saw many old types though not one face that i had ever seen before there was one however that soon attracted my attention and fixed it it was not a lady's face as you may be imagining though there were present some of that sex the landlord's helpmate who presided over the coffee-pot with some three or four younger specimens of the backwoods fair her daughters and nieces all however were absolutely without attraction of any sort and i somewhat bitterly remembered the mou of double meaning with which my friend had entertained me at parting venus was certainly not visible at the swampville table d'hote for the presiding divinity was a perfect hecate and her attendant damsels could have found no place in the train of the cytherian goddess no the face that interested me was neither that of a female nor in any way feminine it was the face of a man and that in the most emphatic sense of the word he was a young man apparently about four or five and twenty and costumed as a backwoods hunter that is he wore a buckskin hunting shirt leggings and moccasins with bullet pouch and powder horn suspended over his shoulder and hunting knife sheathed in his belt the coonskin cap hanging against the adjacent wall was his headdress i had seen him place it there before taking his seat at the supper table with the personal appearance of this young man the eye was at once satisfied a figure of correct contour features of noble outline a face expressive of fine mental qualities were the more salient characteristics that struck me at the first glance regarding the portrait more particularly other details became manifest round hazel eyes with well-developed lashes brows finely arched a magnificent shock of nut-brown curling hair a small well-formed mouth with white regular teeth all contributed to the creation of what might be termed a type of manly beauty this beauty appeared in a somewhat neglected garb art might have improved it but it was evident that none had been employed or even thought of it was a clear case of beauty unadorned, and the possessor of it appeared altogether unconscious of its existence. I need not add that this mental characteristic on the part of the young man heightened the grace of his personal charms. Why this young fellow fixed my attention I can scarcely tell. His costume was by no means uncommon, though it was the only one of the kind there present. It was not that, however, nor yet his fine personal appearance that interested me but rather something i had observed in his bearing and manner as we were seated opposite each other near the foot of the long table i had an excellent opportunity of observing him 
notwithstanding his undoubted good looks sufficiently striking to have filled the possessor with vanity his deportment was marked by a modest reserve that proved him either unaware of his personal advantages or without any conceit in them by the glances occasionally cast towards him from the opposite end of the table i could perceive that miss elvina and miss carline were not insensible to his attractions neither however had reason to congratulate herself upon any reciprocity of her favouring glances the young men either did not observe or at all events took no notice of them the melancholy tinge pervading his features remained altogether unaltered equally impassable did he appear under the jealous looks of some three or four smart young storekeepers influenced no doubt by tender relations existing between them and the aforementioned damsels whose sly espiglieri of the handsome hunter could not have escaped their observation the young man appeared to be rather friendless than unknown i could perceive that almost all of the company were acquainted with him but that most of them especially the gentleman in broadcloth affected an air of superiority over him no one talked much to him for his reserved manner did not invite conversation but when one of these did address a few words to him it was in the style usually adopted by the well-to-do citizen holding converse with his less affluent neighbour the young fellow was evidently not one to be sneered at or insulted but for all that i could perceive that the broadcloth gentry did not quite regard him as an equal perhaps this may be explained by the hypothesis that he was poor and indeed it did not require much penetration to perceive that such was the reality the hunting shirt though once a handsome one was no longer new on the contrary it was considerably scuffed and the green baize wrappers upon his limbs were faded to a greenish brown other points proclaimed a light purse perhaps far lighter than the heart of him who carried it if i was to judge by the expression of his countenance notwithstanding all this the young hunter was evidently an object of interest whether friendly or hostile and might have been the cynosure of the supper-table but for my undress frock and spread eagle buttons these however claimed some share of the curiosity of swampville and i was conscious of being the object of a portion of its surveillance i knew not what ideas they could have had about me and cared as little but judging from the looks of the men the broad cloth gentlemen in particular i was impressed with a suspicion that i was neither admired nor welcome in the eyes of your sovereign citizen the mere military man is not the hero that he is elsewhere and he must show something more than a uniform coat to recommend himself to their suffrages i was conceited enough to imagine that miss alvina and her vis-a-vis miss carline did not look altogether unfriendly but the handsome face and magnificent curls of the young hunter were beside me and it was no use taking the field against such a rival i was not jealous of him however nor he of me on the contrary of all the men present he appeared most inclined to be courteous to me as was evinced by his once or twice pushing within my reach those delicate dishes distributed at very long distances over the table i felt an incipient friendship for this young man which he appeared to reciprocate he saw that i was a stranger and notwithstanding the pretentious fashion of my dress perhaps he noticed my well-worn coat and conjectured that i might be as poor and friendless as himself if it was to this conjecture i was indebted for his sympathies his instincts were not far astray End of chapter eleven